Thank you. We now have topical questions. Question number one, Liam MacArthur. The President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding how it could assist in accommodating 3,000 unaccompanied refugee children. Minister Hamza Yousaf. Uh, Presiding Officer, Scotland has a proud history of providing refuge to vulnerable people, and this group of children is, are, are especially uh, vulnerable. The Scottish Government welcomes the interventions by organisations such as Save the Children uh, and Citizens UK to raise awareness of the plight of 26,000 Syrian children estimated to be in Europe. We have repeatedly called on the UK Government to do more. Action must be taken promptly to avoid some of the tragedies that we have seen already in the last few months. Uh, I have raised this matter in conversation with Richard Harrington, the UK Government Minister for Refugees, and it has also been discussed at the Scottish Refugee Task Force. Lee MacArthur. Can I thank and agree with the, the, the Minister's response there? As Save the Children have pointed out, making it to Europe does not mean children are safe. Uh, while its position appears to be softening, the UK Government, I believe, has so far not played its full part in offering shelter. Every day it waits, 3,000 unaccompanied orphan children sleep rough unnecessarily. These children are not only vulnerable to deadly winter conditions and disease, but also trafficking and exploitation. In order to demonstrate that Scotland is ready to play its part, have ministers uh, indicated how many unaccompanied children Scotland could accommodate? And have Scottish ministers made it clear that these 3,000 children should be in addition to the 20,000 the UK Government has pledged to take from camps around Syria? Minister. I agree with the sentiments behind uh, Liam MacArthur's uh, question in terms of his specific points. Uh, uh, we have had discussions uh, with COSLA. In fact, I have just come off the phone uh, with COSLA about this issue. It is fair to say that local authorities uh, are also very sympathetic. All of us would be very sympathetic uh, to this. Uh, the point that COSLA makes, and I think it is a very valid one, uh, is that there, there has to be a well-resourced package that goes behind that uh, unaccompanied children. Uh, that is uh, quite a resource-intensive uh, uh, endeavour to, to undertake. So, therefore, uh, we agree with COSLA in that. Uh, we would like the UK government to make a decision, because ultimately the decision to accept Syrian uh, refugee children, unaccompanied children, is one for the UK government. Uh, if they do make that decision, uh, then it is important that, through the Scottish, with the Scottish Government, with the Scottish local authorities, they have that discussion uh, around uh, a, a well-resourced uh, package. So, yes, we are willing to, to play a part. I have made that known. I have written to Justine Greening, the International Development Secretary, to let her know that Scotland is willing to play her part. I know from speaking to COSLA, they also are willing to do so. I am just about to meet Save the Children shortly after this to discuss the pro proposal in more detail. But anything that we can do uh, and that we can make it known to the UK Government that we are willing to play our part, uh, the Scottish Government certainly will do. Last question. Um, and I th again, I thank the, the Minister for his comments. These children, as you will be aware, will be some of the most vulnerable individuals to arrive uh, in the UK, fleeing terror and persecution. They need protection and a future. In relation to the resources uh, he, uh, he mentions, and I fully accept the point, the Minister will have seen the report in the Sunday Herald at the weekend suggesting the number of children referred to the Scottish Guardianship Service has risen by 80 per cent since 2014. Uh, has the Scottish Government discussed this escalation with the Guardianship Service and will it undertake to examine how it can help ensure there are enough guardians, sufficient access to supported accommodation and the foster care placements required? Minister. Uh, I thank Liam MacArthur uh, for, the, for the question. I would say uh, I did see the Sunday uh, Herald report, and obviously the Scottish Government uh, commented on that. It should be said that uh, through funding the Scottish Guardianship Service, uh, which the funding has increased, the Scottish Government uh, enabled separated children to learn about the welfare and immigration processes directly, uh, making the information relevant to their specific circumstances. But uh, that notwithstanding, uh, I know that the Scottish Government uh, very much will continue to have those discussions uh, with local authorities, because they will be key partners in everything uh, that we're doing. Uh, I think uh, the political momentum around the issue of refugee children, unaccompanied refugee children, uh, is overwhelming. Uh, I know Tim Farron has been very vocal, Jeremy Corbyn, on a recent visit to the Scottish Government, uh, most certainly. Uh, it's, it's important that we ensure, from a Scottish perspective as well as across the UK, that local authorities are given the resources that they require to do that. And that will be very much for the, 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 the decision of the UK Government. But, uh, I have to say, in credit to the UK Government, having approached this issue of the refugees, uh, they, have, they, will, they, they did that uh, previously in a very open manner, uh, and I hope that they will approach it in a very open manner, in a very uh, open-minded manner with local authorities, uh, should they make a decision to take unaccompanied children. And just to answer his direct point from a previous question, which I did not, uh, yes, this should be up above and beyond the 20,000 that they have agreed uh, to take. Roger Campbell. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister provide any further information as to how the Government assists unaccompanied refugee children in interacting with the care system? Minister. Through our work with the Refugee Task Force, uh, we have worked extensively with local authorities to ensure that uh, local children, uh, Syrian refugee children that have come in through the VPR scheme, uh, have been made to feel settled. Uh, different local authorities have approached it, of course, in different ways. Uh, some children were put straight into the school system. Other children were assessed to not be quite ready, and that uh, entry into the school system was staggered. Uh, throughout the Christmas period, uh, children were given gifts, were given toys, were made to feel welcome uh, and, uh, during, during the Christmas uh, period. Uh, in terms of their specific needs and care needs, uh, they will work uh, ch refugee children. Uh, will be uh, worked through the, the, the care system at local authority level, much like Scottish children would, but with the additional understanding that there may be complex needs beforehand. And it should say, should say that those complex needs that any children have would be assessed pre-arrival uh, into Scotland by the UNHCR and by the UK Government. Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I also thank all the members who signed my motion on this particular issue? Uh, as the Minister has, I think, acknowledged, there are already unaccompanied children coming to Scotland. Obviously, many of us in the Chamber would like to see that number increase, as has been discussed. But um, I wonder whether, uh, recognising the burden that this would place on services in local areas and in Scotland as a whole, whether, in spite of that, we should demonstrate our willingness by putting in place the mechanisms that would allow us to have the foster carers that will be needed to look after these young people and these children and the other mechanisms that will be needed to support them too, because by the time they come here, we need to have those um, mechanisms in place so that they can be supported not just adequately, but appropriately to their, as the Minister said, very complex needs, because they are often the most vulnerable children that um, are, are uh, in the particular camps that uh, they're located in at the moment. Minister. I think, the member, I think the member makes a very valid point. The Scottish Government uh, works closely with local authorities to ensure that we have uh, in place uh, as many foster carers uh, as possible. But yes, she's right. There's a need, particularly in the big cities, uh, particularly in the cities that uh, Patricia Ferguson and I represent uh, in Glasgow. I'm also, uh, my extended family are also foster carers, and I know foster carers from BME and ethnic minority communities will be particularly important because of the profile of the refugees uh, that will be coming here, and that's another issue that we have to, to, to look at. In terms of actually demonstrating it, what I would say is although provision exists for, uh, although we already have unaccompanied asylum seekers, that's obviously very different to unaccompanied refugees uh, that will be arriving. So if refugees are taken, uh, then the profile, the complex health needs of those children, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, should be known. So it should be slightly more controlled, be able to be managed. Uh, but uh, of course, we have to work with local authorities, and uh, that's why it's important if the UK government does make a decision on this, that they immediately enter into discussions, as they have done in the past, with local authorities through COSLA or indeed bilaterally, whatever suits them best, uh, and they come to uh, an agreement on a package that is suitable. Uh, because local authorities, of course, will have to deal with the, uh, the burden, if that would be the right word, uh, the financial cost uh, and implication uh, of taking unaccompanied uh, refugee children. Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, it's helpful that the Minister sounds positive about discussions with the UK Government. But if the UK Government decide not to go ahead with accepting unaccompanied children, have the Scottish Government given any thought to what support they can offer UK charities and European charities who are supporting unaccompanied children within Europe? It will be part of the discussions that I have with say, the children uh, later on today. She will know, of course, uh, that the Scottish Government can't unilaterally accept uh, refugees. Uh, that was a, ultimately a decision for the UK Government. Uh, what we have done already is given uh, a fair amount of funding to, re to NGOs working in, for example, Lesbos, uh, where a number of refugee children, uh, unaccompanied children, are becoming. In fact, when I was on the island of Lesbos, I saw, come, as a dinghy came into the shore, uh, a number of young children who were there with uh, not their parents, not even with their blood auntie and uncles, but with maybe neighbours and so on and so forth. And they were uh, then uh, uh, in a very vulnerable position uh, indeed. So uh, if there is more that the Scottish Government can do in that, then of course we'll always look to do that. And that'll be part of my discussions uh, with the Save the Children. Ultimately, a decision is one for the UK Government. I, I am positive about it because the noises have been very, uh, very positive in the last few days. Uh, let's hope a decision is made soon because this is a crisis that is going on uh, right here, right now. Question number two, Mark MacDonald. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recent research by Pinsent Masons regarding the North Sea oil and gas industry. Minister Fergus Ewing. 
I welcome the fact this report indicates optimism in the medium and long term future of the oil field services sector despite the challenge of the low price. With 22 billion barrels of oil and gas remaining, there are still many opportunities in the North Sea, but maximising them will require a concerted effort from everyone, from industry, governments and the new regulator. We continue to stand alongside the oil and gas industry in Scotland, doing all that we can to improve collaboration, cooperation and innovation, creating a more competitive sector, as well as further developing its status as a global centre of oil and gas expertise. In order to encourage investment and further uh, merger and acquisition activity in North Sea operations, we urge the UK Government in their spring budget to bring in a series of tax measures, including clarifying decommissioning liabilities, a refinement of the investment allowance to include OPEX, and further fiscal measures to incentivise exploration in order to increase the international competitiveness of the UK CS. Mark MacDonald. I welcome the response from the Minister and welcome the action the Scottish Government is taking by Energy Jobs Task Force to minimise redundancies where possible and to uh, assist those facing redundancy where that arises. Uh, the Minister has outlined, I think, a number of very sensible measures that have been put to the UK Government. Has he get, received any indication in his discussions with UK Ministers as to their openness to these approaches, given the support that is required for the industry and its wider supply chain? Minister. Well, we have not, as, as yet, so far as I'm aware, received any indication as to what the UK Government planned to do in their spring budget, but I did uh, take the opportunity when attending the Oil and Gas Day on the 17th of December to urge upon the UK Government the, the need for action in this spring budget. And I am able further to confirm, Presiding Officer, that the Scottish Government Cabinet at a meeting this morning uh, discussed these matters and confirmed that we shall be seeking the UK Government to step in and take a series of necessary fiscal steps in order to assist the oil and gas industry at its time of greatest need. Mark MacDonald. I thank the Minister for his response and I hope that the UK Government will, will approach this in an open manner and listen to these constructive suggestions. Can I ask the Minister, um, concerns have been expressed to me by offshore workers regarding the impact uh, of the current belt tightening within the industry on the offshore safety culture. And does he agree with me that while the industry is engaging in a drive to cut costs, that must not lead to it cutting corners? Minister. Yes, I absolutely agree with Mark Macdonald. He is absolutely right. And I'm pleased to say that uh, in meetings with operators and service companies, uh, it is always stated by them that safety is and must remain paramount. And indeed, that was the case when yesterday I met two major operators in Aberdeen, major operators in uh, the North Sea. And I also think that it is encouraging, presiding officer, that uh, many of the operators uh, who are facing the toughest challenges ever, I think it's fair to say, in the oil and gas industry, are seeking to meet the challenge to have greater efficiency by specifically consulting the workforce, by asking proactively and engaging with the workforce in order to ascertain how things may be done more efficiently without jeopardising safety. And I think that willingness to reach out and involve the workforce as full partners in meeting the challenge uh, that the industry faces is uh, very welcome and absolutely the correct approach. Lewis MacDonald, followed by Dennis Robertson. Thank you very much. Prince and Mason have correctly highlighted the important role of the Oil and Gas Authority if our recovery is to be achieved. Does the Minister not accept the urgent need to go beyond tax reliefs? at a time when the tax companies are paying is not even 1% of what they were paying five years ago, to go beyond tax reliefs and to support further direct investment by the OGA in exploration in order to ensure that recovery going forward? Minister. Uh, well, I, I have, and I did urge the OGA, Andy Samuel, with whom we have very good relations and work closely, and the UK Government, that measures need to be taken to encourage more exploration. I have to say, Presiding Officer, I'm not yet convinced that the UK Government have taken this on board. Uh, I hope that uh, they, will, they will now, but I do uh, agree and I think it's fair to say that we have repeatedly called for more exploration. The level of exploration has dropped to parlously low levels. Uh, and in order to maintain the teams of expertise of people 
specifically an exploration. There needs to be more work for them to do. So I entirely agree that that is necessary. Uh, but it's not simply a matter of dismissing tax reliefs, although perhaps Mr McDonald wasn't seeking to do so. It's also recognising that, uh, that, that whilst tax is not the main focus of industry at the moment, it frankly is survival. Uh, tax is a necessary tool in the box that can contribute towards the objective of surviving to thrive thereafter. Uh, and in particular, very many operators, presiding officer, that I've met in the last few weeks have fairly intensive engagement with the industry, and I won't name them, but many, many operators have said the same thing. There must be clarity of decommissioning liabilities. The lack of clarity is impeding investment. It's blocking deals. Those deals could secure the future of the constituents of Mr McDonald, uh, and therefore I do urge the UK government to include in their spring budget the necessary steps upon which I know they are obtaining advice in order to allow those deals, to allow that investment, which will considerably assist the industry in its toughest challenge. Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister last week welcomed the uh, EET Committee report. Um, I wonder if the Minister is able to indicate whether or not he's able to uh, help with the cooperation and collaboration with the trade union movement and the oil and gas companies, and indeed look carefully at the supply chain within the industry, because there are many people with many skills in the supply chain that feel that they are being forgotten. Minister. Um, yes, I think Mr Robertson is absolutely right, and uh, I, I think it is recognised within the industry that perhaps in the past they have not used the supply chain to best effect. They have not adopted the available technology. There is a, a fear of being first in adopting new technology, nor has there been, uh, I believe in some cases, a willingness to listen to the supply chain and how to meet the needs of operators in the most cost-efficient fashion. But there are signs that in uh, drives towards standardisation that that is now happening. Uh, in relation to the other matter that Mr Robertson raises, of course we meet uh, regularly with representatives of the trade unions in all sectors, and that of course includes the oil and gas sector. I have made it my business to ensure that we are in, in touch with what they say and we value their advice, particularly since many of them have been in the industry for several decades. Uh, so we work very closely in partnership with industry, but also the trade unions, uh, and especially, I think, to take account of the very real issue of safety working in offshore conditions. So we will continue to work with our trade union colleagues uh, very closely in future. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business 